Dancing with Life was written, uh, inspired by, and with the encouragement of my teacher, the Venerable Ajahn Sumedho. His teacher was the Venerable Ajahn Chah, who was a meditation master in the Thai forest tradition of the last century, a quite inspiring individual. And Ajahn Chah's approach to enlightenment, to finding liberation, was to find liberation in the life around us. To say that in this very life, in the very everyday experiences of this life, we can find liberation. We, we can have insight based on the experience. We can find uh, the, uh, the, the, where we are clinging and letting loose of clinging in daily life. And I wanted to uh, start our reflective time together with a quote from, I'm going to do more than one quote this evening, from this little book, which is a free distribution book. And I don't know if there are many copies available now or not. I've had mine for so long. It's called Everything is Teaching Us, a collection of teachings by the Venerable Ajahn Chah. So here we go in terms of his language. We are living in this world. The Buddha wanted us to know the world. Living in the world, we gain our knowledge from the world. The Buddha is said to be Lokavita, the one who knows the world clearly. It means living in the world, but not being stuck in the ways of the world living among attraction and aversion, but not stuck in attraction and aversion. Repeating that, it means living in the world, but not being stuck in the ways of the world, living among attraction, that is desire, and aversion, but not stuck in desire and aversion. So the Buddha said you should take the Dhamma as your foundation, your basis. Living and practicing in the world will take yourself, your ideas, desires, and opinions as a basis. That is not right. The Buddha should be your standard. If you take yourself as the standard, you become self-absorbed. This seems so obvious. If you take yourself as a standard, you become self-absorbed. If you take someone, someone else as your standard, you are merely infatuated with that person. Being enthralled with ourselves or with another person is not the way of the Dhamma. Isn't that beautiful? So that there is this uh, willingness to trust our daily experience when we approach it with insight, when we approach it with the mindfulness that allows us to know the world. So how do we know the world? We know the world by being fully present for what's arising in our experience and then being willing to receive it so that we have the felt sense of it, the full impact of it, and then to investigate it investigating it in many ways, but always with the underlying goal of knowing this is suffering or this is not suffering. And in time, creating the ability to have choice to choose that which is not suffering as opposed to that which is suffering. It's ironic because we actually more fully open to our suffering in order to be able to choose non-suffering. One more quote from his that I had not planned on reading, but again, this is the Venerable Ajahn Chah. There are two kinds of suffering, the suffering that leads to more suffering and the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. If you're not willing to face the second kind of suffering, 
you will surely continue to experience the first. So simple and yet so subtle. We open to our experience, which means we will know the suffering of our experience, but we will know it in such a way that we start to have choice, choice to choose non-suffering. In everyday things, very practical things, doesn't have to be some special moment on a retreat. At home, at work, in the supermarket, at the doctor's office, driving down the street, all of these opportunities to know the world. I used during the guided meditation that this moment is like this, that the warmth in the belly is like this, the tingling in the hands are like this. The knowing of and knowing you know this um, reflective way of knowing rather than being consumed by the knowing is the trick of this. And most of our experience with when we're in our untrained mind moments, we don't so much know experience as get lost in it. We're identified with it, we're fascinated with it, we're dazzled with it, we're overwhelmed by it, we believe it, and we get lost in it. And as a result, we cling, we grasp, we contract, we act unwisely, we speak unwisely, we hold on to in a way that we create subjective suffering. There's objective suffering in life, whether it's physical pain or emotional loss. That kind of suffering is the dukkha of this world. But the dukkha of the mind is our interaction with the dukkha of this world. And that is subjective in nature, and in that we have choice. So it's often said that pain is inevitable as part of life, but suffering is optional. It's a little maybe too pat, but there is a distinction between when we have choice, but we don't realize we have choice, and things that are just the, 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 the nature of this realm. So it is our karma to be in this realm of change, this karma of to be in this realm where there is physical pain, there's old age sickness and death, there's uncertainty, there's the loss of our loved ones. This is the karma of this realm. We're all born into that, it's a shared karma. But our, our reactivity of mind to that is something where we can really start to make a difference. We can move from a reactive mind that grasps, that clings, to a responsive mind that responds from the heart, responds from our deepest value, where moment to moment we're actually living our intention as to how we want to meet life. Life, regardless of the conditions, to be able to meet life on your terms no matter what life presents as a dance partner. That's freedom. And it's here and now, it's immediate. It's, it's, it's not in some elevated state on a three-month retreat. It's here and now, that's the teaching of Ajahn Chah. So uh, inspiring in that way. It takes a long time to develop this new relationship with life because we, in our conditioned mind, our habitual mind, tend to be controlled, oftentimes subconsciously, by the pleasant or unpleasantness, the, what's called Vedna, the second of the Buddha's four foundations of mindfulness, the Vedna of an experience. Again, this Ajahn Chah. You feel that unhappiness is hard to see while happiness is easy to see. That's just the way your afflictions work. 
Aversion is hard to let go of, right? It's a strong feeling. It's true enough that aversion is hard to let go of when we're really caught in aversion. But then he's making a real point here. You say happiness is easy to let go of. It's really not that easy. It's just that it's not so overpowering. Pleasure and happiness are things people like and feel comfortable with. They're not so easy to let go of. Aversion is painful, but people don't know how to let go of it. The truth is that they are equal. Or cons it's just that we don't incline to them equally. When there is unhappiness, we feel bothered. We want it to go away quickly, and so we feel it's hard to get rid of. Happiness does not usually bother us. So we're friends with it and feel we can let go of it easily. It's not like that. It's not oppressing and squeezing our heart. That's all. Or consider praise and criticism. Do you feel that praise is easy to let go of and criticism is hard to let go of? They are really equal. But when we are praised, we don't feel disturbed. We are pleased. But it's not a sharp feeling. Criticism is painful, so we feel it's hard to let go of. Being pleased is also hard to let go of, but we're partial to it, so we don't have the same desire to get rid of it quickly. The delight we take in being praised and the sting we feel when criticized are equal. They're the same. But when our minds meet these things, we have unequal reactions to them. He's pointing so profoundly to our daily lives. We have lots of moments when we feel praised, Lots of moments when we feel criticized. You know, when the Buddha taught the worldly winds of, of gain and loss, pain and pleasure, fame and ill repute, praise and blame. Freedom in our lives is not being caught in either, not having to hold on to either. And it's a challenge on either side of this. There's a practice that I'm offering that I've, I've uh, some of you may have heard me teach this on a retreat, but it's part of a, I've, after four years, five years, I've finally completed uh, my next book, which is uh, in the Ajahn Chah tradition of about daily life. And it's called From Emotional Chaos to Clarity, How to Live More Skillfully, Make Better Decisions, and Find Purpose in Life. And it takes the Nautilus as the symbol throughout the book. And uh, there's a practice, I offer many, many practices of everyday life in this book. It'll be out in the spring of next year. I'm not really here to talk about the book. But it, uh, this one practice I personally found so useful in relation to what Ajahn Chah is teaching us. And that is to distinguish between our experience versus our interpretation of the experience. We tend to mush it together. We get immersed in our reaction to our experience, to our interpretation of our experience so deeply that we tend to think they're the same thing. But they're really not. It's, it's really easy uh, to find this distinction. You can just notice a pain in your body and describe to yourself as though you were a scientist. What is this pain? So say it's knee pain. Oh, there's twisting, there's burning, there's stabbing, it's throbbing, it's contracting. Oh, now it's expanding, now it's contracting, contracting, now it's feeling hard, hard, twisting again, oh, burning. Those are all sensations. Likewise, uh, unpleasant, 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 unpleasant. This, this, uh, felt sense of knee pain, or uh, the, uh, the uh, feeling all cozy in your bed on one of these cool Seattle evenings. Oh, warm, warm, uh, comfortable, comfortable, ease, ease, pleasant, pleasant, pleasant. Oh, soothing, soothing, relaxing, pleasant, and so on. Those are the actual felt sense of either of those experiences. Then there's a reaction to it. Knee pain, oh, bad, this is terrible, I, should, I did this to myself, it's not fair this happened, why is this happening to me, oh, I'm getting old really fast, 
oh, you know, my brother doesn't have this, or if I had just not done that, and, uh, you know, I, it's, it's my, the, how bad I am with my body, and all of this reactivity of the mind to the experience. This means I'm having a, 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 a serious uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and da 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 da, and here we're in our story. All interpretation of the experience. The very first step in this exercise is making that distinction. So that you're talking with your difficult sibling, your brother or sister that's, you know, really tough to talk with, and you're having a conversation. And once again, you're being accused or found fault or disappointing her or him or not doing enough or there's this quiet disapproval or this, uh, you're hearing how, well, you know, dad always liked you more, or you're the lucky one, whatever it is. And so you're having an emotional experience. Your mind or your, your mind heart is, is feeling uh, rejected. You're feeling uh, uh, blamed for something. You're feeling denied something. You're having a difficult conversation and it's unpleasant. It's very unpleasant, but that's all. That's the experience. Why did I call this person again? This is never going to stop. This has been true forever. I can't wait to tell my friend Jane, my friend Bob about this time, what they've said now. <laughs> uh, you know, if this person just had the, uh, did some more therapy, if they would just listen to me, this all came about because of what Dad actually did do, and it's not my fault. All of this interpretation, all of this story making, that story making is separate from the emotional experience of having a difficult conversation with a sibling. It's two different things. You may go, well, of course that's obvious, or you may go, on, what's he talking about? Either way, just stick with it and explore it. They are two different things. We're going to have lots of experiences. And we're going, when, without thinking, without training, we're going to interpret those experiences immediately. And then we're going to identify with our interpretation of them. This happens at work. This happens with your family and friends. It happens uh, very easily to watch it around uh, all the politics of the moment, whatever your political persuasion is, because we're so at odds with one another in this country now. And you can, you can uh, watch your mind, hear someone saying something, they're just saying their values, or they're saying an idea, and you can, because you disagree with their values, or their ideas, or their solutions, you can watch yourself interpret them in this large negative way and make up such a story that is really alienating, creating other in that person that you don't have to automatically do, even though they may really be different from you and their understanding of the world. And then even with yourself, you can watch you do this with yourself all by yourself, where you have an experience with yourself you're upset with yourself in some way, or you're very pleased with yourself, and something's good that's happening to you, or whatever it is, and then you start interpreting that experience right away. I mean, before you've even enjoyed the fruits of it, if it's a pleasant experience, you're very busy interpreting. We all do this. And in doing that, we actually miss a great deal of the lived experience, because we've already moved to our conceptualization of our experience. In the Abhidhamma, the Buddhist uh, uh, sort of collection of uh, sort of the science of the mind as people interpreted what the Buddha said in his text. The Buddha did not create the Abhidhamma. It, uh, there's, it, it's described how each mind moments made up of this series of steps in which, which we create a, a, a reality. And I'm not going to go through all these steps. It takes too long to set it all up. But there's only one 
of this whole series of steps where it's the actual experience, whether it's a smell experience, a hearing experience, a seeing, a tasting, a, a felt experience, or a mind gate experience. All of these steps, only the very first step is one of actual receiving the experience. All the rest is what the mind does. That's just to get to a moment of perception. So you imagine then, when we're not going to perception, now we're going to interpretation. So we've already, just to get to perception, we moved away from the, the actual input through the mind massaging and so that it can interpret. It's the, those inputs, you could call it data, and the mind does all this with data, and then it has a perception. And then uh, beyond that, we then make an interpretation based on a whole series of things, including our habits of mind, including pleasant and unpleasant, and so forth. And then we believe that, that concept. And we, we're very faithful to it, so often to our detriment. So learning to stay with the experience. When we are living from our interpretation, we are missing a lot of the richness of everything. The cold air, the cool air, if you stay with the experience of the cool air, it's a very rich experience. If you immediately jump into go, no, you know, did, did I, do I want to turn the thermostat up or is this going to get more cold or this is colder than usual, and you start commenting on your experience, you're no longer having the experience. You're now like you know, one of those commentators on television that's commenting on some news that may or may not be factual that they first reported, but they're giving their view of the experience. They're not actually, they aren't having the experience. You weren't, you're having the experience of their have, interpretation of the experience. And you do that same thing. We all do that same thing when we're not conscious of it to ourselves. And so we actually miss much of the richness of aliveness moment to moment in our life. Ajahn Chah was a master at getting people to be aware of the richness of life just now. And in the same way, when we, uh, when we get lost in our interpretation that way, we're much less likely to have insight that brings well-being. We're too involved in the story. It's like uh, we're watching a movie and we get so lost in the movie that we don't realize we're separate from that movie. We are lost in the movie of our own life that we're actually making up as we go. Even when your interpretation is true, it's not all of the truth. It's not all of you. It's it, your interpretation that is not necessarily the fullness of the meaning. And it is still removed. It's removed. So your significant other touches your cheek or gives you a hug standing in the kitchen. Oh, how sweet, how tender. We don't do enough of this. I want to do something nice for him or her. Da, 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 da. <laughs> what happened to the pleasure the, the sweetness, the gratitude, the connectedness of that hug. Gone, gone. So staying with the experience rather than the interpretation. One way, if you're interested in this, is you, in your daily life, you don't have to change anything, you don't have to sit anymore, nothing. You just do as you are already doing, and you can make the, your interpretations, your object of meditation, the way you make breath an object of your meditation. So now, instead of breath or seeing pleasant or unpleasant or whatever it is you do in your, your sitting meditation, you make interpretation your object. So there you are at work, someone walks by and they frown, and you go, did I say something to them? Are they upset with me about something? Oh, interpretation. What happened was this person had what I perceived to be a frown. Maybe it wasn't even a frown. 
chances are quite high it was nothing to do with you. So, you're, but again, it might be, but chances are not. But it doesn't matter because you're lost in the interpretation. Again, something you're having a disagreement with your significant other, and you're you are you have all of these things that uh, you, these views and opinions about how this uh, uh, you know she or he is just wrong for this reason and that reason da 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 da, and you feel yourself aligned with your view rather than aligned with that other person for whom you care so much. That's an interpretation. You don't smack your wrist for it because now you're interpreting in a judging way your own experience, but rather you stay with it as an inquiry. Wow, this is truly just my view and opinion. This is an interpretation. What am I giving up to be so enmeshed in this interpretation? What is not available when I'm caught in this interpretation? Oh, well, my heart space towards the other person's not available. Oh, well, my own sense of well-being, my sense that, oh, there's, this is a little difficult moment, but actually I feel pretty good overall. All of that gets lost as we're sucked into these interpretations so often. Again, so much of this happens because we get pulled into our interpretation through pleasant and unpleasant. I cannot stress that enough, that the, the, the habitually starting to notice pleasant and unpleasant and how it's affecting interpretation can um, uh, make a gigantic difference in your well-being. So I have trained my mind for a series of things that I just notice automatically. So when I'm not tasking, rather than daydreaming or commenting on experience, I just notice what's present. And one of the things that I notice is pleasant or unpleasant with every experience. I've just trained my mind through many, many years that I just notice that. So while I've been talking with you tonight, I have noticed many moments of pleasant and unpleasant. It's quite freeing. It takes a while to get this going, but it's quite freeing because we believe things, we interpret because of that pleasant and unpleasant. But we don't have to, and when we don't, it, then pleasant and unpleasant become interesting rather than realities. They're just interesting. Oh, you, so like I can feel my whole body posture, or my energy body's posture in relation to a moment of pleasant and unpleasant. And I can see it uh, start to go more one way or the other and, and just watch it as, as it's happening without letting it go on. It just, it ceases to get fixed. It stays more in the neutral area, more available to feeling each of you because I'm aware of it. I'm not trying to be aware of it. I've just cultivated over and over and over again thousands and thousands of moments of being aware of pleasant and unpleasant. Interpretation is not the direct experience of something. You can say, and there's some of you out there that would split hairs this way, you'd say, ah, oh, but there is a direct experience of interpreting, and that's true, that's true. If you're doing that, that means you're being mindful of interpreting, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> but as to everything else, the interpretation is not the experience. I must have said this 20 times now, and I wonder how many of you actually think that that might be true. How many of you have said, is that really true? Uh, that might be true. Am I willing to go look at this for myself? We are so addicted to our interpretation that we will avert rather than open to this. I've seen this a lot. In one sense, when we are unwilling to stay with our experience, it means, as I describe in Dancing with Life, we're unwilling to bear the first noble truth. We go to interpretation to avoid the truth that there is suffering, that there is dukkha. 
the interpretation gives us a way to uh, numb ourselves or feel in control or uh, to, to be uh, uh, puffed up about something uh, rather than to just stay with the experience. So that is one way of, of looking at this is in what way in this moment am I not willing to be present? What am I not willing to be present for? Because a lot of the interpretation will be around the negative, around the unpleasant, but then even around the pleasant. When we start commenting on the pleasant, we don't have to realize its fragileness, how quickly it changes. If it's something pleasant with someone we love, we don't have to realize, oh, this child of mine could get sick tomorrow, could be dead tomorrow. We don't have to know that. And it, on the surface, it would seem like, well, that's okay, because we, we have to not think about this all the time. And that's true. So there's a kind of healthy uh, movement of directing attention. So what we, it's in, in psychology, it's called healthy suppression. In Buddhism, it would be wise effort, right effort. But, that, but the, you don't have to use the interpretation to get to that. Because it's to, to, to uh, go over and over again around the fragility of life is, 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 is not wholesome. It's, it's morose in so many ways. But we can, we can see it as it is and then let go of that too. So yes, you, you, can, you can love someone knowing the fragility of it all and it becomes then poignant. It doesn't become heavy or, or uh, making one uh, uneasy. When we are caught in our self-referencing, you know what that is, your self-referencing? Where you're the center of the universe? Where everything's happening to you, where everybody's bad mood is somehow about you? Or why everybody, it's, it's about what they need from you or what you need from them? When we're caught in this self-referencing, in my experience, that is uh, quite often uh, uh, indicating that we're caught in the interpretation of the event. So the, someone you care about is in a bad mood. It's about them. Oh, uh, uh, have, being present with Jane when she's in a bad mood feels like this. Being present for Jim when he's in a bad mood feels like this. See, it's not about you, it just feels like this. Can you feel that difference? There's a space there, there's space. You don't have to run away. You created space through being present rather than uh, going to some other place. So you get the benefit of getting to be alive, of getting to be present in the moment. Interpretation itself is part of life. We are wired to interpret. If you're out in the savanna in Africa and you're our ancestor and you see a rustle in the high grass and you go, oh, seeing, seeing, seeing. <laughs> you didn't make it as one of our ancestors. <laughs> you were eliminated from the gene pool. So the tendency of the mind to look and see, is this, is this something to eat or something to mate with or something that might eat me, is understandable and not the problem. But it is the degree that we get absorbed in the interpretation. We believe it, we, we move away from the experience. And, and well, to give you, to stay with the savanna, so you go, oh, well, that may be, there may be a lion out there. I just gotta, I just gotta stay frozen here. I gotta run back. You would never go hunt. You never really learn where is there a lion and not a lion. And that, that person also didn't make it in our gene pool. Because you have to, you have to grow, you have to learn. And you, so you have to find out what's true by staying present and exploring the experience of the moment on every level. So as we, we make stories in daily life, in our modern life, 
Our story making gives meaning to our lives. It gives us a kind of reassurance, a kind of comfort. It gives us some predictive ability. It allows us to know what's being called for here in ways. So in of itself, if we just said what's, what is to be learned here, that would be one thing. But we go much further than that, much further. As Ajahn Chah said, we get pulled into the world, we become of the world. It's not that we're in the world that's the problem, it's that we become of it. We get so identified with our interpretation that we fail to discern that it's just a story. And we start to obey the story rather than the felt experience. We become imprisoned by it, deluded by it. We miss all of the other possible stories that might be presenting itself. And so we don't get to weigh all the stories we're attached through habit of mind to a particular story. And as I've said, we miss the aliveness. And oftentimes, we also fail to see the clinging that's involved in our interpretation. So we're failing to see the second noble truth, that the cause of suffering is the tanha, the thirst, our wanting of something to be a certain way, our wanting of sense pleasures, or our wanting to become something, or our wanting not to be, these three kinds of uh, thirst that happen, that is described by the Buddha in the Second Noble Truth. So we miss that. I have a friend uh, whom I've known for, I was telling him yesterday, for 30 some years now, and his, his name's John Levy, and um, uh, he's a dear, dear friend, and um, he's, at that age of his late 80s, where he's now starting to have a lot of struggle with his memory. And it's um, gotten, it's really changed fast in a year, year and a half. And um, I was just with him yesterday, and John is one of these people, I don't know if you know the, the, the Jewish legend that there's seven good people who hold the world together. And if, if there are such seven people, John is one of those seven people. He's just good. He's just good. I mean, he's just, he's just one of those people. His whole life, he's just good and uh, quite inspiring in that way. And uh, he loved to uh, have dinners and reflect on things. And he would, he would get people, different people together and have these dinners. And he'd like to have these deep discussions. And he, he'd, uh, he would think about this and read and read and read and love to talk about all this. And now, he can't do it. He can't remember. He can't remember what he's read. He can't remember who he saw recently and so forth. And we, so we spent the afternoon together yesterday and uh, we took this hike. And uh, just, he, he has to walk slow now, but we walked around uh, this little park there in, in Berkeley. And, uh, as we were doing this, he would uh, see one thing in nature and go, that is so beautiful. And then he would, he would see something else and say, I am so grateful to be alive. He knew what he was doing. He had adjusted to his memory so he didn't try to engage in conversations that he couldn't engage in. He didn't complain once about not remembering. He acknowledged, I don't remember. And there was times when he wouldn't necessarily know that he was like, he would, he would say something to me and then five minutes later say it again like he had not said it five minutes ago. But he knows he has a memory problem. He could go into a very big interpretation about this and feel sorry for himself in many ways. And he, has, he shows no signs of that. What he sees is beauty, gratitude, and his relatedness to his wife. He just, he feels such tenderness and describes such tenderness. Because this is within his range of experience. It's his range of experience. None of that was interpretation. This was what he was feeling. We spent these hours together, and all he was reporting was what he was experiencing. He can't remember enough to interpret, in one sense, 
But in another sense, he's so wise, he's not doing that. I've been in the same situation with others who had a very different reactive mind to this same challenge. Very different, a lot of embarrassment, a lot of faking it, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of apathy, a lot of giving up. And John's fully alive. He's just fully alive. So inspiring. You could say that was the karma of all of his own sitting practice, all of his own study and reflection. Or you could say he's innately wise. It doesn't really matter exactly how it came about because that's back to the interpretation, the story. The experience of being with someone like that is this is a role model. This is a teaching. We can be like this. But in order to do that, we have to at some point start to make some distinctions in our own life where we're not feeding our own movies, not feeding our own interpretations. Some of you are quite accomplished and it is a big high to be an accomplished person. You can get a lot done and you can uh, you do it really fast and a lot of people depend on you or uh, your whole family depends on you or this, this volunteer organization you're part of really depends on you and, and all of these kinds of stories out there and they're true. They're true. For now. For now. But to cling to that, to, to start to, to get lost in your story making around this versus the experience of this moment. Oh, I'm getting to help. It feels so good to help. I'm so grateful I can help. Oh, look at, I can get all of this done. I'm so appreciative that I can hold this many balls, keep these many balls in the air at the same time. I'm really appreciative of this. But it's not me or mine. It's just like this in this moment. That's the experience. The, uh, making a self that can do all of that is the interpretation. That's, that's creating uh, atta rather than anatta, not, not self. Our interpretation is the self-referencing that leads to this self that will inevitably then find the suffering. The first not interpreting is Ajahn, Sumedho, Ajahn Chah saying uh, to, uh, uh, to choose the second kind of suffering, the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. To not interpret, to not be addicted, to not be clinging to our interpretation is to, to choose the second kind of suffering, the suffering that leads to non-suffering. I have such sympathy for us all because I too want certainty in my life. I want to, to make sense of things. I want things to make sense. I don't like not knowing many times. And yet, don't know mind is really essential for the practice of mindfulness. Mindfulness just knows what it feels like. It doesn't claim that it knows what it is. It's, it feels like this but it's not making the interpretation uh, about anything. So how do we break this pattern? First of all, we anchor our attention firmly in experience. And this is what mindfulness, compassionate mindfulness will do. I've taken more and more to calling it compassionate mindfulness because there's too many experiences that we can't stay with without a lot of compassion. It's too difficult. Seeing the suffering of, of people you work with is too much if you don't have compassion. You don't want to do it. You'll, you'll do anything. It's far easier to be mad at them or be impatient with them or to be judging them. So this compassionate mindfulness allows us to stay firmly in the experience. And then we start to note when we go to interpretation. Wow. So here I was being with this, with this my colleague, who's the difficult co uh, colleague, who's the mild enemy. And look at now I'm interpreting this. Do I really need to have any viewer opinion about him? I have adjusted to working with him fine. I've adjusted to working with her fine. Why am I doing this again? Why am I having this thought again that's really an interpretation? It's not serving anything. My mind's just doing this. No, I'll come back and just be with the experience of being with this person. And that's the third step, is to return to the experience. 
So first, you work to stay in the experience rather than the interpretation. Secondly, you know it when you've left it. And three, you return to the experience as best you can. And then four, you look for patterning. And what, what is your pattern in various situations in your life? And you can, in months, really start to see your pattern in just a few months. It's not, some things in, in Buddha Dharma take a long time, they take years. But seeing these kinds of patterns do not take long. And then we start to see where interpretation is really causing dukkha for ourselves or for others. I mean, we see that, and as we see it over and over again, we will eventually change the pattern. Just the scene. People don't believe this, but just the scene, if we really stay present for what it feels like to be causing the dukkha, it stops in time. And then you can ask yourself, as you notice your pattern, in what ways are, are you hurting yourself or others? And then you can, uh, you can again, practice with the, staying with the experience of hurting yourself or another. What does it feel like to hurt yourself? In, the, in terms of what we eat, or our sleep patterns, or our work patterns, or our not being available to children, whatever it is, just what is it, whatever the interpretation is justifying this, in what way is it hurting? Because so oftentimes we miss the hurting of others or ourselves because of our interpretation. We rationalize before we've ever had the experience. The, um, uh, two years ago, three years ago, I was uh, uh, teaching a day long with Jack Cornfield, and for, I think, 12 years, I would teach all of his day longs at Spirit Rock with him. And I would uh, be in the hall with him twice during the day, but otherwise I would sit in this little room and do interviews. So sometimes I would do as many as 37 interviews in a day. This is a lot of interviews. And I, um, I became uh, quite skilled at uh, uh, trusting intuition in this because I had so little time with uh, each person. And because Jack was the most uh, popular in terms of widely read uh, Buddhist teachers in our particular tradition and the lay teachers in the West, he, would, he, uh, he still does attract lots of beginners and lots of people that are looking for, uh, you know, thinking that Buddhism can immediately make their pain go away. And uh, so I, he did not have time. He was in there teaching, so I would then receive all these people who wanted their pain to go away instantly. <laughs> Very good practice for me. <laughs> I was the beneficiary more than they were. And uh, so this one woman came in one time, and she had this whole litany of difficulties. And um, I listened and I listened and I listened. And I said, you know, I don't have any advice for you about these difficulties. They're so entwined that there's, there's nothing from this moment that I would say in terms of uh, doing a particular thing about a particular difficulty. And, um, and I said that the one thing that I would suggest to you is when you go back in there and you sit in this day, and then when you go home and for the, for the rest of this, uh, this week and the rest of the month, you s just pay attention to your experience and not your interpretation. That's the one thing I can say to you that might bring some help to this. She kind of gave me this disappointed look <laughs> and she left. And then um, uh, uh, when... Um, uh, Two months ago or a month ago, something like this, she shows up at my Sunday Sangha, which you're all invited to come on Sunday evenings in Marin. And uh, she, at the, when the Q&A period, she, says, she stood up and she said, I just want to say that uh, you don't remember me, but I, she didn't describe the same thing I've just described to you. And she said, I left there thinking, what's all that? But then when I actually did it, it made all the difference. And she said, I now, she says, I'm a speaker. Of, uh, I go around and speak to groups. So now I go around telling all these groups, stay with the experience, not the interpretation. <laughs> so a, a, a pretty powerful uh, experience in that way. 
we, we don't do that in part because we, we think we're supposed to do, we, we interpret because we think we're supposed to do something rather than be. But lots of times we don't know what to do or we will do it anyway. We don't really need to interpret to do, we already know. We are interpreting in order to reassure ourselves to justify. We already have an intuitive knowing that this is what we're going to do in a situation. And other times we have to wait to know something. We don't know yet. It's like that woman with her many difficulties. A poem by Wendell Berry. It's called The Real Work. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. When we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded, impeded stream is the one that sings. The impeded stream is the one that sings. That woman's difficulties were the rocks in the stream. If she wasn't going to be with the rocks in the stream, where was she going to hear the song of her life? That's where the song of her life was, was in those rocks. They weren't somewhere else. They weren't in her view and opinion about it. The, 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 her view and opinion wasn't in the stream. It's up in the nether nether where, we, we, where nothing exists except speculation. So it's such a challenge to be willing to trust our lives, to show up for the experience, and to let loose, not totally abandon, but let loose of our addiction to the interpretation. But it is possible, slowly, slowly, steadily, steadily. The experience and not the interpretation. There will be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> What's the mantra for the week? So questions or comments, disagreements, anything you would say, please.